kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestrian Blind Commentary. First off, I'll actually like to make a quick shout out to KCAT, who's been supporting this series, and I like to thank you so much because you've been giving me more confidence in my videos. Thank you so much. And also, if you are watching this currently, please leave a link. Send me a link so to your blog you've been telling me about. I would like to go visit it. Thank you. Also, um, in the comments below, guys, I would like to t I like your opinion on what it, um, pfft, sorry, can't English, on this so far, and, like, on this series so far, specifically, and also, I would like to apologize beforehand, if I'm appearing a bit off, I am a bit tired, I have went on a ruck march today, and I am very exhausted, and I'm in a lot of pain, so, don't worry. So don't be upset or anything if I'm a bit slow at first. Also, we're on chapter four, perspective, and um, this video, uh, the chapter is about thirty-two, a little over thirty-two minutes long. So I think we should get right into it, shall we? So let's go. So stupid. A blast of lightning fired past me shattering an old clock at the back of the overview office I was cowering in. The Wasteland Survival Guide was full of all sorts of helpful tips. Scavenging guides, a whole chapter on mines, and more. And then there were the no Whoa. What just happened? Not so uh, helpful ones. After having read the chapter on making pre-war Earth Pony technology work for you, my first thought when I came across the ruins of Ironshod Firearms was to take a peek inside and see if there was any technology I could make work for me. Instead, I got myself trapped in a maze full of ponocidal robots and automated turrets, fleeing until I almost managed to back myself into a corner here in an office box high above the factory floor. I was almost out of ammo, I might add. If I hadn't found that medical box in the employee bathroom, I would have died trying to get across the second floor. How could I possibly have been so very stupid? Below, three of those robots were rolling about, looking for me. They were tracked things, built to somewhat resemble ponies, with clear domed heads that house real brains. I refused to think that the ponies who built them might have used other ponies' brains in the construction. I know what he's referring to. I remember in Fallout 3 that um, they had in the chamber where you found your father, and... They had these robots that had these brains in their head. It was kind of weird looking uh, when I first looked at it, but now I know what he's referring to. The thought was just far too horrible for me to consider. Even doing that to an animal's brain was clearly awful. And 200 years of continuous operation had done nothing for their sanity. Come on, Al. We only want to kill you for trespassing. Case in point. The fact that the voice sounded like a young filly, despite being clearly artificial, just made them that much freer. Fortunately, the railing on the catwalks leading up to this office were too narrow for the brain bots to get up here. A much deeper, authoritative voice boomed across the room. Surrender in the name of the Ministry of Technology, zebra scum. I cringed behind a line of metal filing cabinets as the room zebra? filled with a rush of flame. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for the other type of guard robot I'd crossed paths with in here. The multi-limbed things looked like giant metal spiders. Many of its arms seemed to end in weapons, including a buzz saw and a flamethrower. And worse, the damn things could fly. I slipped both of my grenades out of my saddlebags and waited until the flames died away. The metal cabinets were beginning to get unpleasantly warm against my back, and the heat in the air seared my lungs. The second the flamethrower cut off, I turned my head around the corner and levitated them both right up to the metal monster, pulling out the stems on the way. The moment it saw me, the robot raised a pulsing green weapon that looked like a unicorn's horn. Eldritch fire erupted from it, shooting past me close enough to singe my cheek. The blast struck an old fan sitting on the desk behind me. It glowed green for a moment, then melted. I ducked back as I dropped the grenades. The explosion rocked the office. I heard a fearsome twang as part of the catwalk outside gave. Looking back, the robot was in a non-functional heap. The walkway outside was still mostly intact, but sagging badly. I wasn't sure it could hold my weight. 
Stripping what I could from the fallen spider bot, I considered my options. I couldn't stay up here forever. If I moved very fast, I could run the walkway without the brain bots below getting me. Their weaponry did not seem very accurate, but the first few yards of the catwalk had partially torn free and sagged alarmingly. The more I looked at it, the less I wanted to put a hoof on it. I'd never tried levitating myself before. In theory, it should work, but I'd never seen a pony do it. Focusing, I tried. I could feel the glow from my horn stretch out and envelop my entire body. Brighter it glowed as I tried to lift myself. I was shining like a dozen lanterns when I felt my body lift just slightly from the ground. I was sweating. This was as far as I could go, but I was doing it. Now one step forward, and another, and another. I was halfway across when the brain bots started firing lightning in my general direction. One of the bolts struck the catwalk, arcing along it. I felt very lucky that I wasn't actually touching it, but I was also almost spent. Ahead of me, the catwalk stopped right before the huge windows that let twice-filtered sunlight, once by the clouds and once by the dirty glass itself, onto the factory floor, supplementing the light from the heavy fixtures hanging above. The catwalk shot off in both directions, running parallel to the wall. One was the direction I had come from. The other led to a door which had been locked. Only, that door didn't have a lock to pick. Instead, it could only be opened by a command from a terminal. Another shot of lightning missed cleanly, shooting through one of the shattered windows of the observation office and frying the terminal I had just used not five minutes ago to unlock said door. It was a lot of metal catwalk. The damn bots beneath me shot lightning. I grunted with the effort that kept me aloft, feeling my vision darken at the edges. I had to stop, or I'd pass out, and that would be the end of me. Releasing the magic, I had dropped onto the catwalk. It wavered, but held. I let go of a breath I didn't realize I was holding, and started to gallop. Don't run! We want to be your friends! More blasts. I tensed expecting to feel paralyzing electricity rip up my body, starting at my hooves. Instead, I heard a crash, a loud pop, and a twang from somewhere above. Looking up as I ran, I saw that one of the bolts had hit the hanging lamp above, causing its softly buzzing light to explode. And that, freakishly, was the last straw. It snapped loose from the badly aged cracked ceiling above and swung down, crashing into the catwalk behind me. The whole walkway shook, and then the section behind me tore away with a rending scream of abused metal. Oh, fuck me with Celestia's four hooves. I'll admit... Watch your language, damn! The descriptions had grown more profane from my experience with the raiders. But as I galloped down the walkways at a heart-tearing speed, I was trying to keep ahead of the sections of catwalk that began to fall down onto the factory floor like a thunderous, lethal game of dominoes. I felt the sentiment was entirely appropriate. I was almost to the door when the metal walkway dropped out from under me. I threw myself forward, carried only on momentum, and caught the final section with my forelegs. I hung there, my hind hooves dangling several stories over an ancient rifle assembly line that had been crushed by the fallen catwalk. I struggled, trying to inch myself up. I used my magic to try to tug one of my saddlebags and drag me forward. My heart was pounding. I fought to keep visions of falling from dominating my imagination tried not to think of my back breaking as I landed on the conveyor belt below. At least the damned brain bots weren't shooting at me anymore, having scurried for cover. It seemed to take forever, but inch by inch I pulled myself onto that final section of catwalk. It wobbled threateningly beneath me, sticking out from the wall like a diving board, held in place by bolts that wheeled in wear-widened holes. Cautiously, I got my hooves under me and stepped lightly towards the door. A blast of lightning hit the catwalk, shooting up my legs and sending me into painful convulsions. I collapsed, shaking on the walkway, my mane and tail hair standing on end. The walkway responded with a metallic cry and tilted several inches, threatening to dump me into the gulf below. I struggled, shakily, to my feet. Another blast shot up from almost directly beneath me, missing the walkway by less than a foot and striking the ceiling above. Bits of singed plaster rained down. I gave the door a push, and was vastly relieved when it swung open. Then the catwalk gave further. I lurched, wrapping my forelegs around the doorframe to keep from sliding down the now quite steep metal platform. 
A third electrical blast ripped through the air, striking another strip of industrial lighting whose light also exploded, making it swing perilously. Grunting, I pulled myself into the room. I turned and sat in the doorway, looking down at the brain bot rolling circles directly below, trying to figure out how to get to me. Then, with a strong kick from my forehooves, I knocked the last of the catwalk loose. It fell, scraping down the wall until it smashed the robot's brain case, pulping the organ inside and continuing down, ripping the machine roughly in half. I must admit that I found the crunch immensely satisfying. I realized that if the room I had successfully accessed at such great personal risk had not offered another way out, I would have been in deep trouble. Closing the door behind me, I felt immediately more comfortable. The room had been painted in what might have once been a bright orange, and the paint had not lost all of its warmth over time. The wood paneling probably brought a pleasant, homey feel to what I believed was clearly the factory over Mayor's office. Now, though, the wood was rotted and crumbling. On the back wall above the desk was an oversized logo in deeply tarnished bronze. Iron shod firearms. How do you like them apples? I didn't get it. Ignoring it, I looked around. Large fancy desk, chair, filing cabinets, a poster in a backlit frame. The same poster I'd seen several other times in the factory, but this one in better condition, showing in graceful Pegasus ponies soaring through the sky, rainbows exploding behind them as they shot down on a dark, demonic striped figures with evil glowing eyes. Better wiped than striped. Join the equestrian forces today. A wardrobe. Wait, let me hear that again. Did I hear that correctly? Except that such great personal risk had not offered another way out, I would have been in deep trouble. Closing the door behind me, I felt immediately more comfortable. The wood paneling probably brought a pleasant, homey feel to what I believed was clearly the factory over Mayor's office. Now, though, the wood was rotted and crumbling. On the back wall above the desk was an oversized logo in deeply tarnished bronze. Iron shod firearms. How do you like them apples? Poster in a backlit frame. The same poster I'd seen several other times in the factory, but this one in better condition, showing in graceful Pegasus ponies soaring through the sky, rainbows exploding behind them as they shot down on a dark, demonic striped figures with evil glowing eyes. Better wiped than striped. Join the equestrian forces today. A wardrobe. Okay. Am I getting this right? That, okay. Based on what I've heard so far in this chapter, um, apparently this war was with zebras. Apparently. And I'm guessing that's the, like the symbolism of World War II, um, according to the Fallout story. Or was it World War I? I don't remember. Um, but whichever war it was, that's basically what this is referencing. The war between ponies and zebras. Since zebras aren't technically ponies, I guess it does consider them another race. Um, but I'm guessing that's what they're referring to, and I'm thinking this is a, a pre-war poster. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's just a regular pre-war poster. I guess it's asking you to recruit. You know, in high school, where they uh, teach you the propaganda posters... You know, I remember having to make one. For some reason, I ended up making a Hitler post, Hitler meme poster for a propaganda poster. I don't know why I did that. But it was really, really weird. <laughs> but on, the, on another note... Um, that, that's pretty interesting, because I had to hear that again. And it was... Oh, sorry, I'm hitting the mic. Um... <laughs> this is actually pretty, pretty accurate, yeah, to like, you know, to, to the war store, like, to m our war in real life, to what happened, what happened in Fallout, and what's relevant in My Little Pony, and I think that's pretty cool. So let's, let's continue, we're uh, about ten minutes My in. eyes barely touched these, moving to the important things first. The office held a terminal I could hack, a wall safe I could pick, and a personal elevator that, if it worked, would get me safely to the first floor and out of this death trap. There was an ammo box under the desk. Then my eyes fell on something unique. Mounted on the opposite wall was a glass case. And in the case was a beautiful and perfectly preserved revolver. A similar model to mine, 
but crafted with what must have been approaching to love. It had a scope, and an ivory bit molded for extra comfortable fit in the mouth and in ease of trigger. On the handle was an emblem, three apples. I tried my hoof, so to speak, at the safe first. It was tough, taking a few attempts, but after breaking one bobby pin, I learned better how to prevent further losses. The safe opened with a generous click. The impressive amount of objects made me wonder if my excursion into iron-shot firearms hadn't been worthwhile after all. I started sorting the treasure from the rubbish. Inside was a stack full of pre-war coins, a copy of Equestrian Army Today, a whole bunch of finance papers that ceased to mean anything hundreds of years ago. A box of what looked like bubblegum, though I couldn't decipher the writing on it. A spark of magic battery, and finally, an odd hoof-strapped Arcanotech device that looked like it was meant to interface with my pit buck. Curious, I slid it on and let my pit buck analyze it. Stealth buck. Invisibility spell. One charge. Hot damn! Next was the terminal. Pulling out my utility suit, I slid out my access tool and started to work. This terminal was tougher to crack than the previous ones. Even with my tools, I had to abort several times to avoid getting locked out. I pulled another apple from my bag and bit into it, intent on the screen, only to hit something painfully hard. Levitating the apple up to eye level, I saw a bullet embedded in it. Looking down at my saddlebags, there was indeed a small hole, although it took me a few minutes to remember when that had happened. Once in, I discovered a whole mess of old notes and messages. In addition, the terminal had a shutdown key for all the robotic security, and it could remotely open both the safe and the display case. I rolled my eyes, thanking the universe ever so much for giving me this potentially life-saving option only now that I'd already fought my way to finish it and no longer needed it. I also realized that I could have saved myself a bobby pin if I had worked on the computer first. I told the terminal to open the display case. Doing so triggered a message. Cousin Brayburn, I know we ain't talked in some time, but the war effort's taken a twist for the scary, and it might not have a chance to see again. I want to mend fences. Now, I know I ain't gonna mess this up with words. We all know how well that went last time. Instead, I'm sending you a little Macintosh as a gift and as an apology, to show you I'm sincere. Keep him safe for me, will you? The accent was very much like the voice that I found in Velvet Remedy's pit book, although this time it was clearly not from the same pony. But it was the earnest tone of the recording that made me pause. Two hundred years ago, some pony had given this gun as a token of apology and as an effort to reconnect with family. And that some pony's cousin had done just as she asked, preserving the weapon for generations after his own death. I wasn't going to leave it there, untouched by any pony until the building collapsed on it. But when I took it, I removed it respectfully. All that was left was going through the rest of the office. The ammo box held bullets for a little Macintosh, and not a shy amount. In the wardrobe, I found some old maintenance suit that I could use to repair the holes in my own utility parting and other garments that I left behind. Eventually, I turned to the elevator and pushed the button. Nothing. Of course it didn't work. The wasteland just couldn't give me a break. Pulling up my tools, I opened up the side panel and tried to figure out what was wrong and if I could fix it from here. To my great relief, I could. The elevator proved to be in impressive condition, particularly considering the rest of the building. But the battery for the interface was dead. As Celestia's mercy would have it, there had been a replacement in the safe. One swapping of batteries later, I was on my way. As the door slid shut, the thought crossed my mind. Macintosh, wasn't that? I trotted between the collapsed buildings that littered the area around. Okay, before we continue, I have to comment on that little recording that Little Pip just heard. She, what I've he um, what I'm hearing, I'm assuming. I'm going to assume this is Applejack, because they didn't give a name. But, I'm going to assume it's Applejack, and it sounds like she's making an apology to Brayburn. And, and I'm guessing the little Macintosh was actually named after Big Mac. And, my god. Ah. Uh, man. That, that's actually putting some emotions in me right now. God. That is some pretty inter interesting information. I, um, man, the story is really getting into me right now because there's so much connection to actual My Little Pony. Like, there's so much relevant.
relevance to it. Ugh. Well, anything below season four, obviously, but... Found iron shot firearms, not having any particular direction to go. Aimless. I hadn't found any signs of civilization. Civilized civilization, mind you. I had kind of given up on finding Velvet Remedy. For now, I was satisfying myself with random exploration, although that had proven exceptionally dangerous. In Stable 2, I knew exactly what my future would be, as unbearably dull as it would have been. Out here, in the huge open outside, I was struggling with just the opposite. I never considered that having an assigned place might be as much a relief as it was a burden. My ears perked at the sound of overwrought, triumphant music. I watched as the Sprite bot fluttered down across the street. Running up to it, I drew myself around in front of it. Watcher? It just floated by. I dashed in front of it again. Hello? The music just kept playing. I waved a hoof right in front of its lack of face. It danced around me and kept going. Well, that was helpful. I picked a random direction and started trotting again. I thought of Watcher's advice. Armor? Check. Weapon? Double check. Guidance? I looked back at the Iron Shop building. A bit iffy, but check. Friends? It's kinda hard to make friends when there doesn't seem to be any pony around. My exasperated voice echoed off the crumbling walls of concrete. If this was a quest, it was a lame one. I seriously needed to find something to do. Preferably other than dodge and duck. In stable two, dodge, duck, dick, dive, and dodge. <laughs> the five Ds of dodgeball. Now, I yearn to be anything. My downcast eyes chanced upon a red rider scooter amidst the ruins. Reaching out a hoof, I flipped it back onto its wheels and prodded it back and forth a few times. Three of the wheels were locked with rust, but to my surprise, one still turned. Looking up, I found myself at the edge of a playground. The swings and slide jutted into the oddly colored air, blackened by ancient spellfire, like bones of a great dead beast. The merry-go-round was warped and canted. The skeleton of a baby pony was still curled at one end. Sadness and immense shame flooded me. I had been feeling sorry for myself in the midst of all this. Another tiny skeleton lay against the burnt husk of a tree, three roller skates in the dirt near its hooves. The fourth? I doubted anyone would ever know. I plodded along, moving through the silent impromptu graveyard. Sorry. I get emotional sometimes, and that surprised me. Let's keep going. At the far end, sheltered by walls that were mostly still intact, I found an old vending machine. Sparkle Cola, the machine still advertised through the years of grime. It featured a backlit emblem of stylized carrots. Surprisingly, the machine still looked functional. Fishing out a few pre-war coins, I fed them into the machine. I didn't actually expect that it would still have soda after all these years. I was astonished when a bottle rolled out dutifully. I suddenly realized how awfully thirsty I was. The Sparkle Cola was lukewarm, but actually rather delicious, with a delightfully carroty aftertaste. The clicking of my pit buck warned me that I was ingesting trace amounts of radiation with each swallow, but not enough to be harmful. I'd taken more harm standing around in Sweet Apple Acres. And besides, if it reached a point where my radiation intake began to make me sick, I had a couple Radaway potions, the only supplies from the Iron Shot medical box that I hadn't needed to use just to survive the building. I spotted a bench just around the side of the building and decided to take a load off my legs, possibly read some of the Equestrian Army Today book I had picked up. As I turned the corner, my gaze fell upon an old, torn poster affixed to the wall. The image was the face of an elderly pony of almost obtrusively pink coloration. Her mane was streaked with gray. On some ponies, gray hair makes them look distinguished. On most, it just makes them look old. Hers made her look like candy cane. Her eyes were huge, staring. I could swear, poster or not, she was looking right into me. Some pony had ripped the poster right through the middle. I had no idea what her expression was supposed to be, but I couldn't help but feel like I was doing something wrong. Bold words above and below the image, now deeply faded, announced, Pinkie Pie is watching you forever. There were additional words, very tiny, beneath, so small and faded that I had to lean close and strain to read them. Pinkie Pie? A happy reminder from the Ministry of Morale. 
I stepped back, tilting my head as I looked at the poster again. What's the Ministry of Morale? We've been to... Okay, we've seen Applejack, my shoulder, make Rarity, and Pinkie Pie so far. Another well-meant idea that was so much better on a scroll. Oh yeah, and Fluttershy, yeah. I my heart to be regularly again, and felt a fleeting empathy for Sawed-Off. The Sprite Bot was hovering right next to me. Celestia, those things were silent when they weren't playing music. Are you trying to give me a heart attack? Oh, sorry. I gave the flying orb a glare. I forgot about the bench and started walking, trying to enjoy the rest of my Sparkle Cola. The Sprite Bot followed. I see you've got some armor. The mechanical voice seemed hesitant. I didn't ask why. Watcher either didn't care enough to explain or thought better of it. Maybe the fact that I was walking through the equestrian wasteland in an outfit coated inside and out with drying blood gave it pause. I could possibly go up to any stable pony and go, I'm an evil and bad nightmare pony, R. And even despite my size, they would take one look and flee. I sipped my cola and wished desperately for some place decent to bathe. Problem was, any water clean and radiation free enough to take a bath in would be too precious to pollute. One of my canteens was empty, and the second nearly so. Maybe the reason you're having trouble finding your place is that you haven't discovered your true virtue yet, Watcher offered out of thin air. I stopped. What? How did you know? No, oh, never mind. Then, what do you mean, my virtue? Well, the flying ball began. The greatest heroes of Equestria, ponies with lifelong bonds of unbreakable friendship and strength, were known for exemplifying one of the great virtues of pony kind. Kindness, honesty, laughter. Laughter is a virtue? I asked dubiously. Bowl with me on this. The spray pot continued without breaking stride. Generosity, loyalty, and magic. They really didn't know themselves or each other until one pony came to realize that her friends represented these virtues, and together they grew to live by them. Now I'm not saying that these are the only virtues, they're just a... Now the bot paused as if searching for words. Particularly important set. I'm saying that perhaps if you learn to recognize the dominant virtue in your own heart, you will find yourself. And you won't need anyone or anything else to tell you your place in the... Watcher's voice cut out with an abrupt pop, and music once again poured from the bot. Brilliant. I watched as the sprite bot slowly sailed away. Well... If that wasn't a load of pony pies, I don't know what was. Finishing my soda. Okay, that is interesting. So, he literally just quoted... He basically just said the first two episodes of My Little Pony right there. He basically summed it up in just a few seconds. Think about that. That's pretty much what happened. Yeah, I'm loving this series. I really am. And I hope you guys are enjoying this too, because I, I, I love this so much. And, oh, uh, God, I'm getting so much emotion right now. Uh, man, sorry, my back hurts. Uh, man, so much. I can see why this is called perspective. And, wow. Ah, let's go. Amidst a pile of others. Empty bottles littered the equestrian wasteland like weeds. A new thought occurred to me, about Watcher. The Wasteland Survival Guide had been written after the Megaspills rained down. Long after, considering its sound advice on scavenging. So that book wouldn't have been in the Ponyville Library as part of the original, pre-war library. It found its way in there. From the lack of being burned, defaced, or covered in blood, I was guessing recently. Which made me wonder, did Watcher know about those poor ponies the Raiders held captive? And if so, is that why I was talked into going in there? Was I manipulated into walking into that horror because Watcher hoped I would free them? I couldn't be sure, and considering that Watcher saved me, I should give the benefit of the doubt. But I couldn't help the niggling sense that Watcher had played me, and I don't like being tricked. My ears perked as the music stopped again, replaced by a voice. But this wasn't Watcher's voice. This was some pony else. The voice wasn't metallic. It was the voice of a smooth male pony with a greasy charisma. Friends! Ponies, rejoice. Although the world about you is bleak, scarred, and poisoned by the war of honorless, thoughtless, inferior ponies of the past, we do not have to live in the shadow of their greed and wickedness. Together, we can raise Equestria back to its former beauty. Together, we can build a new kingdom where all live together in perfect unity. 
It's already happening, my good ponies. Already, the foundation for a new and wonderful age is being built. Yes, it's hard work, but don't we owe it to ourselves and to future generations of ponies to be better? No, to be the best we can possibly be? I'm telling you now, as your friend, as your leader, that we can, we must, and we will. What in a fever dream was that? The music had resumed, not popping back in the middle of a song like when Watcher seized control of the sprite bot, but at the beginning of a new song, like this was how the bot was supposed to work. Wait, ponies have a leader now? That was serious news to me. As far as I could see, we didn't even have a country. Hell, I'd settle for a town. Even just a few shacks built within vague proximity to each other, so long as they had ponies living there in peace. Or as close to peace as the wasteland allowed. If we had a leader, we had to have at least one town, right? Trotting faster now, I found a ruin with enough intact stairs for me to get up and see what was left of the second floor. I brought out the binoculars and looked about. Sure enough, in the distance, I saw smoke. Enough plumes close enough together to suggest some sort of settlement. I prayed to Celestia that the smoke was from cooking fires, and not raiders burning it to the ground. There was a path leading out towards the settlement that would keep me from losing my way, and there was movement on that path. My horn glowed as I followed the binoculars, bringing a small group of ponies into view. Two of them were pulling a heavily laden wagon. A young pony rode on his back, apparently talking with two others who were guiding equally burdened two-headed beasts. The group was headed towards me, away- Bobisons! Bobisons! I think that's what they're called. I don't know. I know the the, the two-headed cows. Um, you gotta imagine that, though. You gotta remember that the cows in My Little Pony actually are sentient. So, yeah. So you gotta remember that. So are they just two-headed people now? Away from the theoretical town, but they didn't look like they were fleeing, and none of them were wounded. All of which I took for a good sign, a very good sign indeed. I looked up the thick, broiling clouds, up to where the disk of the sun made a brighter spot in the cloudy ceiling, and sent a prayer of thanks to Celestia. The path wasn't a road, exactly. Rather, it was a long, arcing swath cutting through the equestrian wasteland. Two parallel metal lines reinforced the badly aged cross planks of wood. Half an hour back, I had crossed over a gully on a rickety bridge. After my fun with catwalks, I chose to brave the gully rather than putting my hooves on something else that was surely holding off its inevitable collapse until it could take me with it. It turned out to be a good decision, despite the wounds. The gully had been home to a bunch of large, bloated pig things with extremely nasty front teeth. One of them got a hold of my left hind leg, biting clean through my armor and cutting a deep gash. Little Macintosh is neither quiet nor subtle. A single shot from that sweet little gun tore the head clean off the pig thing attacking me and it fires quickly enough that I was able to slay the three others before my targeting spell ran out. Beneath the bridge was some pony's camp. It had a long abandoned feel to it, but there were scattered supplies, including a few cases of shotgun ammo, a single can of food amidst a litter of tin cans. Magical fruit, the label boasted, but it turned out just to be beans, and a locked medical box. I picked the lock easily, finding a health potion, which I quickly drank breathing a sigh of relief as the nasty gash mended gently, the pain ebbing away. There were magical bandages, nowhere near as powerful as the potion, but good for flesh wounds, and a box of... mints. Mint owls, refresh your mind and your breath. I had been surprised to see a smiling zebra on the front of the box, the first depiction of a zebra I'd seen that didn't look like a storybook villain. Now I figured I was over halfway to the settlement, maybe two-thirds. Must be Zakora. I tried to keep myself from imagining what I would find. A whole city of Sakura's already adapted potions and stuff. I didn't want to set myself up for a letdown. Even a few shacks, I told myself. Sorry, Zakora is not the pace of my trot. I heard a gunshot in the same instant that I felt a bullet tear clean through my right hind leg, and another clang off the metal casing of the sniper rifle strapped to my back. I screamed in agony, collapsing to a skidding halt on the rocky ground, clutching at my hind leg was bleeding profusely through the hole torn through it. The bullet missed the bone, and I could tell that sickeningly because I could see it. A 
tossed my head back and screamed again. Desperately, I dragged myself around a large mound of rocks, trying to take shelter from a shooter I never saw. Focusing as much as I could through the terrible pain, I pulled the magic-laced medical bandages from my pack. I tried wrapping my bleeding hind leg, but the bandages were meant for cuts and gashes, not gaping holes. It was soaked with blood and sliding off almost before I had finished wrapping it. I tossed the bandage and tried again, this time pulling the bandage much tighter. It too soaked bright red, but at least it stayed. Shaking with fear and pain, knowing from the sudden chills that my body was going into shock, I looked up and tried to spy the pony who attacked me. I looked all around, but no one was there, and there wasn't a whole lot of cover to be hiding in. These hills of dirt and rock were mostly barren. I felt like my heart swallowed an ice cube when the image hit me that there was a pony out there with a stealth buck. She could be right next to me, pointing her gun at my head, and I wouldn't even know. But then I looked upward, and there in the sky was a rust-coated pegasus pony with an orange mane under a black desperado hat and what looked like two rifles, one strap beneath each wing. The pony had just finished circling back around and was aiming right at me. With panicked instinct, I levitated a large rock in front of my face as a shield. A crack rang in the air, two rifles fired simultaneously. The first bullet struck the rock, sending chips of stone flying and ricocheted lodging in my canteen. The last of my water burbled out at my hooves. The second punched through my armor and embedded itself in my left shoulder, sending me reeling. Again, I collapsed, the pain peaking and then beginning to bleed off, which I knew wasn't a good sign. This time, I didn't think I'd be getting back up again. So, this is what it was like to die. So overrated. My eyes felt heavy. I closed them, I don't think, for long, but... When I opened them again, I spotted the ponies, drawing their wagon coming over the hill. Behind them would be more ponies, guiding pack, two-headed cattle things. I remember the young pony in the back of the wagon. I doubted any of them would be looking up. Forcing myself to my hooves, I began dragging myself into the open. If I was going to die, it wasn't going to be laying down, watching these people get slaughtered. My body screamed agony in my head, but I kept going marching myself on lame legs until I was standing in the path right in front of the approaching group. Turning, I focused through the hammering in my head. I lifted a little Macintosh in the air and pointed it at the rust-colored Pegasus, who had whipped back around and was flying right at me. I stood directly between him and the travelers. My vision was blurry from tears and trauma. I wasn't sure, even with sats, that I could hit him, and I stood no chance against his aim. He was an amazing shot. Technically, he hadn't missed yet. Putting every ounce of me into it, I growled as menacingly as I could, and hoped that a pony who had survived four shots would be mistaken for a pony to be reckoned with. Shoot at me all you want, but if you attack that family, I will end you! To my surprise, the Pegasus' eyes had widened. Instead of firing, he backflapped his wings, coming to a halt in front of me. Whoa, Nelly! Levitating little Macintosh was getting really hard lost all feeling in my shot leg and fell onto my haunches without realizing. I ain't the one attacking the caravan. You are. What? Black was seeping into my vision from all sides. My head was swimming. <laughs> the conversation wasn't making any sense. But at least he was conversing rather than killing me. Weakly. Not attacking. You shot me. Well, of course I shot you. I see a raider pony heading towards a caravan. I'm gonna perforate her till she ain't moving no more. The rust-colored pony glared at me. Then, with a strangely proud look, It's my policy! I felt my forelegs beginning to give. I was near collapse, but the words of the pony caused a fire to flash in my head. Little Macintosh had begun to sink towards the ground, but now it swung up, pointed right between the attacker's eyes. I'm not a raider! The pony pointed at me argumentatively. You sure look like a raider! Seemingly out of nowhere, the colt from the wagon galloped into view. I tried to raise my voice in warning, but nothing came out. The blackness fighting to overtake my vision finally won, and I collapsed, sinking into what felt like a deep sleep. The last thing I heard was the colt whinnying. Calamity, what have you done? Oh my! This was interesting. Hold up here. Um... Wow. This is interesting. Uh, 
Well, okay. So he's, I'm guessing Little Pip finally found civilization. So apparently this guy's name is Calamity by the sounds of it. So also the next chapter is called Calamity. So I'm going to guess that's what it is. So, but, um, damn. Whoa, man. I, and this one was kind of heart wrecking, you know, also because it got me some personal emotions from the show and also what I heard, heard in this. Oh my, uh, but I have to say, I know Little Pip is a female, but she's got balls of steel, but, <laughs> or should I say, actually, I should say ovaries of steel, there you go, um, <laughs> wow, man, I'm, I am, I, I am feeling it today, <laughs> whoa, Oh man, the next chapter is going to be an hour long, guys. Oh, yeah, that's going to be exciting. Uh, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this. And I hope you guys will be happy to join me in the next video. Also, remember, KCAT, send me a link to your blog. I want to check it out. I really do. And remember, guys, I'm always accepting. If you guys want to send me, like, drawings, like, you can email to me or whatever. You can, I'll be happy to show your little art here on the um on this and there's another question i wanted to ask do you guys want me to do other fan fictions too and if you you uh, do what fan fictions because i'll be happy to try them out i'll try to see if i can find an audio oh and if i can't find it i'll try to read it but i'm probably terrible at reading so um anyway guys i'll catch you guys later and stay nerdy my friends bye bye